Tonight, the major clashes in Lebanon's capital city of Beirut, a country mired in economic turmoil and political gridlock. Two militias briefly turning neighborhoods into war zones. At least six people are dead. And there are fears tonight new violence could be coming as the government teeters toward collapse. At the center of the clashes and protests is how the government is handling an investigation into that massive August 2020 port explosion that killed more than 200 people. Just this week, the government suspended the inquiry into what happened. Tonight, Moderna one step closer to becoming the second vaccine booster available for millions of Americans. This booster will be half the dose of the first two initial shots available six months after the second dose. Johnson & Johnson still awaiting approval for its booster. Tonight, the thousands and thousands of Americans on strike demanding better pay and working conditions. 10,000 employees at John Deere walking off the job today. And TV and film studios are bracing for a major walkout by roughly 60,000 crew members. Why are there so many strikes at once? And what comes next? Terry Moran with an in-depth report. We need to let them know that they can continue to take our money and take our money and take our money. Tonight, some relief on the way to help break that supply chain gridlock. The Port of Los Angeles working 24-7. Our Kaylee Hartung is there. Where is the breakdown? The breakdown is in the supply chain in general. Overseas tonight, the fallout after that deadly bow and arrow rampage in Norway. Police identifying the suspect arrested and accused of killing five people and declaring it a terror attack. What we are learning tonight about the suspect and how the rampage began. Don't vote. That's the message from former President Trump to Republicans. Why he doesn't want his supporters to show up. And in Congress, a committee moving forward to hold one of the former president's closest allies in contempt. John Carl is standing by. And the Latina comedian bringing humor to identity politics that at times can create an identity crisis. Good evening, I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. From the heartland to Hollywood, from coal miners to healthcare workers to film crews, we begin tonight with the increasing number of American workers prepared to walk off the job. 10,000 John Deere workers officially went on strike today. They are part of the growing number nationwide of employees demanding better working conditions and wages, especially with inflation on the rise. The John Deere strike, just the latest, by an emboldened labor movement and workers who want a greater share of record pandemic profits in some industries. On Monday, 24,000 Kaiser Permanente workers in California authorized a strike. And we've been tracking that coal mine strike in Alabama for a while now. Workers walked off the job seven months ago. So what comes next? And can workers all across the country get what they're looking for? Our Terry Moran leads us off tonight. <laughs> In the wee hours of Thursday morning, 10,000 workers at John Deere hit the picket lines in Iowa, Illinois, and Kansas on strike for the first time in 35 years at Deere. They're demanding better pay, secure pensions, a fair share of a hugely profitable American company. The company wants to eliminate pensions altogether for new people, and we refuse to sell people down the road like that. Sounds like it's about sticking together. Yes, it's about sticking together now and for the people that come after us and about better pay. Yes, absolutely. The company, their profits have just been through the roof. Workers argue that even as John Deere's profits grew by 61% in recent years and their CEO's salary grew by 160% during the pandemic, their pay has actually been cut. We need to let them know that they can continue to take our money and take our money and take our money. It's day one of this fight, but the women and men here on the picket line, the people who build those iconic green John Deere farm vehicles, they're bracing for a long strike. American workers want more, and they're willing to strike to get it. In Brookwood, Alabama, striking coal miners rally every Wednesday. Every union in this country owes something to coal miners. Yeah. Bolstered by their motto, one day longer. So I stand by one day longer, one day stronger. But those days have turned into months, seven months now. We knew it was going to be a struggle and a fight. 
Braxton Wright is one of the roughly 1,000 workers who left the coal mines and joined the picket lines after failing to reach a deal with mine owner Warrior Met Coal. Larry Spencer is the union vice president involved in the negotiations. Did you think that here in October and heading into the fall, you'd still be here? Did, or did you think that it was going to get resolved? I did think we would get something settled before now. And uh, it's, it just seems to be getting worse. I would like to say this part. They, they might think they're going to break these people's spirit, but they're not. Braxton's wife, Hayden, helps run a supply pantry for strike families. And they're already stocking up on Christmas presents. This is the first coal miner strike the town has seen in four decades. The miners in Brookwood are demanding an increase in wages and benefits that had been cut back in 2016, when Warrior Met Coal's mine was struggling. Now, times are good. We're not even asking for more. We're asking for close to what we lost five years ago. And Braxton, like so many American workers, feels the significance of this moment. I believe the, uh, the labor movement in the United States is, is growing, but I think a lot of them are watching us because they know if we lose this fight, they're next. Nationwide, more and more workers are flexing their collective muscles, seeking to rebalance the old equation between bosses and workers. Decades of declining wages for the workers and skyrocketing executive pay. It's kind of the David and Goliath fight right now. Last week, 1,400 Kellogg cereal workers launched strikes in Tennessee, Nebraska, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. This is a, a simple matter of fact that the, the rich want to get richer. And, and to do that, they take away from the small guys. In California and Oregon, 24,000 nurses and other health care workers at Kaiser Permanente voted to authorize a strike over pay and working conditions. And soon, Hollywood may see a walkout. Roughly 60,000 film and TV workers are getting their picket signs ready, set to go on strike on Monday. If it happens, it would be the first nationwide strike in that powerful union's history and could bring Hollywood to a halt. We have some members in our crafts that are so underpaid that they can't possibly survive in the cities where they provide services. The workers at John Deere voted overwhelmingly to reject a contract that their own union, the United Auto Workers, had negotiated with management. Well, there was a pretty blatant attack on our benefits. They want us to pay more for our benefits. Strikes, which had almost disappeared in America, are back. We're, we're looking at levels of strike activity that are comparable to the mid-80s, which no one says is, you know, the heyday of, you know, working class fighting. But on the other hand, it's been decades since we've seen this much activity. Jonah Furman is a staff writer for Labor Notes. He's been covering every twist and turn of the John Deere negotiations. The deal that workers rejected at John Deere offered a 5% raise in the first year of the contract, not what workers expected from a company that estimates it will make $5.9 billion in profits in 2021. This is really not a case of the company uh, being squeezed and the workers wanting to, you know, get a bigger piece of the pie. There really is a bigger pie here. But going out on strike is such a hard decision to make and a risky one. Unions do not take strikes lightly. It really is a last resort. Heidi Shearholz, the chief economist at the Department of Labor during the Obama administration, says companies have long had the upper hand. And over the years, they've successfully lobbied to change the laws in Washington to weaken American unions. It's scary to walk off the line. One of the things is an employer has right now, under current labor law, the right to hire permanent replacements. And so if once the strike is over, if an employer has hired a permanent replacement, what the, the, the person who went on strike has to sort of go to the back of the line. Companies are pushing back publicly against all this strike activity. A Kellogg spokesperson saying their proposals have been quote, grossly misrepresented by the union. Being away from work puts our people and their families in a difficult position and can create financial hardships. And John Deere releasing a statement to ABC News reading in part, 
John Deere is committed to a favorable outcome for everyone involved and is committed to reach an agreement with the UAW that would put every employee in a better economic position and continue to make them the highest paid employees in the agriculture and construction industries. Our immediate concern is meeting the needs of our customers. And in a statement to ABC News, Warrior Met Cole wrote in part, we remain steadfast in our belief that the eight proposals given to the union are fair and equitable. Warrior Met Coal provides some of the highest paying jobs in Alabama. But on the growing number of picket lines in Brookwood, in Moline, and across America, it's about more than money. It's about respect. Now to Terry Moran, who's outside John Deere headquarters in Illinois. Terry, we can see some of those on strike right behind you there. What have been what have been some of the emotions there on the ground? You've spoken to many of them. You know, Stephanie, the emotions here on these picket lines, it's so intense. After years of frustration, it feels uh, like a dam is bursting here and, and around the country. It's a hard decision to go on strike. It's hard for the workers. They know uh, that they are putting their families in a tough position. But right now it feels like they're fed up not only with pay and pensions issues, but really with the whole system. The pie's getting bigger and bigger for corporate executives and bosses and investors. And what workers here and around the country are saying is that it should get bigger for workers too. And Terry, bigger picture, even workers who are not on strike, many still want to see change, right? That's right. I think what, what happens and has happened in the past is, is once strikes get going, we're seeing strike activity like we haven't seen since the 1980s, it gets contagious. Workers uh, don't feel as isolated. They get a little bit bolder in negotiations and perhaps take that very big, very difficult decision to go out on strike. That's certainly what we're seeing right now around the country with more coming down the road. And, they're not, and they're not giving up just yet. Terry Moran for us in Illinois, thank you so much. We turn now to the supply chain crunch and the log jam at the nation's ports. Some are now working around the clock to get goods off of ships, but a shortage of workers to deliver them is keeping the bottleneck in place, contributing to rising prices for nearly everything Americans are buying. ABC's Kaylee Hartung reports tonight from the port of Los Angeles. Tonight, with the holidays approaching fast, the all-out push to get goods off those backlog ships and onto shelves, with the Port of Los Angeles now running operations around the clock. Officials know the clock is ticking. We're only four and a half weeks away from Black Friday. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. What is sitting in all these containers behind us? Everything. <laughs> Everything you can imagine. Toilet paper, uh, your shirts, um, your shoes. Your Peloton uh, bike. Your bikes, <laughs> right? Computers. Air conditioners. Everything everybody's waiting for. Longshoremen telling me some of these containers have been sitting here for six months with a shortage of truck drivers to get the goods on the highway and into stores. It's not just making things harder to find, it's making them more expensive. This year has already seen record-breaking price jumps for products like children's shoes, up nearly 12%, and furniture, up more than 11%. Quite simply, where is the breakdown? The breakdown is in the supply chain in general. The supply chain disrupted by the pandemic. The cost of shipping containers to move goods from Asia to the U.S. soaring, plus a labor shortage and outdated infrastructure, all contributing to this log jam. We followed the supply chain from the port to the warehouse. And as for those hopes of those goods getting there in time for the holidays, what is that cutoff? It was probably uh, realistically about a month ago. Sounds like we have to start holiday shopping now. Kaylee Hartung joins us now from the Port of Los Angeles. We saw President Biden announce new efforts to help speed up getting goods out of those ports. But are the workers there to get that done, Kaylee? Yes, Stephanie, a big part of President Biden's strategy is to have the supply chain running 24-7. But as long as we have been talking about this crisis that the supply chain is dealing with, we have been talking about a shortage of labor at so many points in that chain. So the question is being asked, if the workers weren't there before, then how will they be there to fill another shift? But one bit of good news I did get today from the union reps at the Port of Los Angeles. They say they have the workers. They have the workers, about 14,000 of them, which between the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of Long Beach, they just need the orders from those shipping companies to get to work to do their part. But they are just one piece in this much bigger supply chain and the seeing disruptions all across the world. Stephanie. Absolutely. So what are they saying there on how long this backlog could go on for and, and what are retailers doing to help get these supplies moving? 
Yeah, so there's no quick fix, right? And optimists are saying six months it might take to work through a lot of these challenges. But one of those longshoremen who I talked to today said he thinks they are going to be working through this crisis well into holiday season of next year. Try to wrap your mind around that. So in the meantime, as they're trying to move everything from toys to appliances and furniture, some big name retailers are saying they are going to start doing more work overnight. Walmart, Target, Home Depot and Samsung, all among the big retailers who are saying they are ready to move more of their cargo in those off peak hours. That's one of those keys, Stephanie, to President Biden's strategy to get this supply chain running 24 seven. Incredible. Thank you so much, Kaylee. I'm joined now by Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Wally Adeyemo. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We saw the actions the Biden administration announced yesterday aimed at easing congestion at the nation's ports and to help speed goods getting out across the country. Are there any other tools the Biden administration can deploy to address this supply chain crunch, especially as we head into the holiday season? Hi, Stephanie. Thank you so much for having me. And yesterday, the president took decisive action to bring parties together in order to deal with the supply chain issues the country has been facing coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. We always knew that coming out of the pandemic, we would have bumps along the way as we reopened the economy. And what the president did yesterday was bring together leaders from the ports of Los Angeles in order to make sure that that port is running 24 hours a day. But what we also know is that much of the supply chains in this country and around the world are controlled by the private sector. So he's also encouraging the private sector to do what they can do to make sure that our ports stay open. And we're going to use every tool in the federal toolkit in order to make sure that supplies are able to move into the hands of the American people as they deal with the pandemic. Ultimately, one of the things the president has been focused on is making sure that the resources that are provided by the American Rescue Plan are getting into the hands of the American people so they can pay for the goods that are being delivered to their house on a daily basis and that we can all make it through the pandemic. But Secretary, do you think more could have been done months ago as we started to come out of the pandemic to get ahead of this? Stephanie, the president has been very focused on this set of issues. We always knew that coming out of the pandemic, we would face supply supply chain issues because reopening up an economy that had been closed down wouldn't be easy. That's why when he announced the American Rescue Plan, he included things like the emergency impact payments and the child tax credit in order to make sure that the American people would have the resources to make it through the end of the pandemic that we knew would be bumpy because it would take time for our supply chains to catch up with demand in the economy. But another impact of this backlog is how it's contributed to rising prices. Leaders like Treasury Secretary Yellen and Fed Chair Jerome Powell have said that inflation will be temporary as the economy more fully reopens. But how concerned should Americans be about high prices staying with us longer and eating into their pocketbooks? Stephanie, you're right that today we face an economy that's in transition. And as part of that transition, we are seeing high prices for some of the things that people have to buy. That's exactly why the president was focused on the American Rescue Plan and ensuring that we got stimulus into the hands of the American people so they'd be able to buy the products that they need. But the reality is that the only way we're going to get to a place where we work through this transition is if everyone in America and everyone around the world gets vaccinated. That's why the president continues to be focused on the idea that we get everyone who can vaccinated in this country. And that while we're doing that, we continue to provide the kind of resources the American people need to make it to the other side. We're paying a great deal of attention to these issues and making sure that we're using every tool the federal government has to address the supply chain issues and to make sure that the American people have the resources they need to make it the other side of the pandemic. Everybody waiting to get to that other side. I want to turn now to an issue that's generated a great deal of controversy, a proposal for financial reporting that would require banks to report accounts with annual transactions over $600 to the IRS. We understand this has the goal of trying to catch wealthy individuals who aren't reporting income that should be taxed. But just explain why the Treasury Department thinks this is the most effective way to achieve that. Stephanie, this is fundamentally about fairness. And it is unfair that people who make a great deal of money are able to not pay their taxes, while those people who earn a paycheck and get paid every two weeks or every four weeks have their taxes pulled out of their income. What we know to be true is that 
hundreds of billions of dollars of taxes aren't paid by the wealthiest people in America. And we know that one of the ways to help find these individuals is to gain some information from banks, two pieces of information, in fact, how much money went into a bank account and how much money came out of a bank account, which will help the IRS track down those people who are seeking to evade our tax system in order to make sure that we're having those people pay their fair share of taxes for the things that they use, like our roads and our bridges and the schools that our children go to. But why is that threshold set at $600? Why not $10,000 or $50,000 or even higher? So you're only getting this information on people who are wealthy enough to be avoiding thousands or even millions of dollars in taxes owed. The reality is that the plan the president has proposed does two things. One, it helps us find the wealthiest individuals who are hiding their income in these financial institutions and make sure that they have to pay their taxes. But it also will make sure that those of us who earn an income through a W-2 and pay taxes every two or four weeks are less likely to be audited because we'll be able to see the transactions that came in. We'll see the transactions in your account, how much money you received and how much money you spent over a period of time. That'll mean that for those Americans who are paying their taxes, on a regular basis and following the law, they'll be less likely to be audited because of this proposal. And Secretary, we cannot let you go without talking about the debt ceiling. Congress has kicked down, kicked that can down the road uh, when it comes to the debt ceiling with the issue now likely to come to head again in December. Republicans have made it clear that they are not going to provide any votes to help raise or suspend the debt ceiling. Then uh, is it time for the White House and Democrats in Congress to move forward with the reconciliation option to avoid another potential crisis? Stephanie, as you know, the debt ceiling is not about new bills. It's about making sure that we're able to pay all of our previous bills and all the things that Congress has already ex agreed to spend money on. Not increasing the debt ceiling would be a catastrophe. It would mean that we're unable to pay Social Security checks. We're unable to continue to pay the child tax credit, which is so important to Americans right now. It would be a catastrophe for the American economy. And it's something that we expect Congress to, to increase, as they've done on a bipartisan basis, time and time again over the last several years and decades. We will all be watching in December. Thank you so much. Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Wally Adeyemo, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me, Stephanie. A major development tonight in our nation's fight against COVID. Another shot has received the OK from the FDA Advisory Committee. ABC's Whit Johnson has the details on which vaccine and by when we can expect the emergency authorization to happen. Tonight, booster shots for millions of Americans who got the Moderna vaccine, now a major step closer to authorization. We do have a unanimous 19 out of 19 yes votes, and that concludes the voting portion. A key FDA panel voting unanimously to recommend that third shot six months after the second dose for anyone 65 and older, 18 and older at high risk from an underlying health condition, or 18 and older whose job may put them at greater risk for exposure to the virus. If the full FDA and CDC sign off next week, Moderna booster shots would roll out to the same groups now eligible for the Pfizer boosters. Given that Pfizer blazed a trail with its booster, it made sense that Moderna would follow suit. There were no safety signals involved. And what we're trying to do is bring your immunity up to the point when you were first vaccinated. And essentially, these boosters will do that trick. The Moderna booster would be only a half dose after data indicated that was enough to restore protection. Overall, the Moderna vaccine has remained highly effective against severe illness and hospitalization, showing less waning over time than its counterparts Pfizer and J&J. &J. Still, Moderna says its booster shot given at least six months after the second dose increased protective antibodies by 15-fold one month later. Moderna also finding side effects from its booster were similar to those after first and second doses. But today, some panel members arguing the main focus should be on getting the 66 million eligible unvaccinated Americans their first shot. The people who are in the ICU aren't there because they haven't gotten a third dose. They're there because they haven't gotten any dose. Tomorrow, the panel will review the Johnson & Johnson booster, along with data on the effectiveness of mixing vaccines. An NIH study also finding there could be an extra benefit for people who got the J&J &J vaccine to get a boost from Pfizer or Moderna. I think these early studies are pointing to the potential value of mixing and matching, but it's likely too early, and we're going to really need more data 
to see sort of full recommendations. And soon, 28 million children between the ages of 5 and 11 could be eligible for their first vaccine shot from Pfizer as early as November 3rd. Today, President Biden promising those doses will be ready to go. If authorized, we are ready. We have purchased enough vaccines for all children between the ages of 5 and 11 in the United States. And many parents eager to vaccinate their children. And Wint joins us now from a mass vaccination site in White Plains. Wint, back to those boosters. What else is the FDA panel expected to examine tomorrow? Stephanie, that panel is expected to vote on whether the data is strong enough to authorize the Johnson & Johnson booster shots. But this discussion about mixing and matching vaccines and whether it's effective will also be getting a lot of attention. Right now, there is not a scheduled vote on that, but the early data is promising. It's a big debate, and we expect to hear a lot more in the coming days. Stephanie? Looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Whit. Now to that deadly bow and arrow terror attack in Norway. The suspect killed five people and wounded three others, leaving a small town outside Norway's capital city of Oslo in a state of shock. Our James Longman reports. The accused killer identified tonight after that horrific bow and arrow rampage targeting victims at random. Espen Andersen Broughton, a 37-year-old Danish citizen who lived in the town south of the Norwegian capital where five people died. Four women and a man, all between 50 and 70 years old. Local media reporting some were found murdered inside homes. Police now saying this appears to be a terrorist act and that Broughton had been flagged for radicalization. The act itself looks like a terror act but we do not know what is the motivation. Investigators say Broughton is a Muslim convert with a history of drug abuse and mental health issues. The attack began at this supermarket when police say Broughton started firing off arrows. One seemed lodged in this wall. I saw a man walking with an arrow in his back, this man says. Police say they rushed to the scene and confronted Broughton, but he escaped and that they finally arrested him on the street about 30 minutes later. Such a horrific incident. James Longman joins us now. James, what else do we know about the suspect? Well, not a huge amount, Stephanie, but I think what's quite clear that, is that Broughton was a bit of a loner. I think this Muslim conversion might be a little bit of a red herring. He was quite clearly a disturbed individual, had been un unemployed for some time, had pretty severe mental health issues, had had drug issues as well. At one point, apparently, had tried to attack his own father with a gun and then left that gun at the scene. So he'd had run-ins with police. Um, we might find out more about him tomorrow. There'll be a, a custody hearing tomorrow. He's currently being held under preliminary charges. One thing that police are going to look at is whether or not he was using other weapons in addition to that bow and arrow. But tonight, people in that town just south of Oslo are mourning the victims, uh, and there is a makeshift memorial so that they can remember the people they've lost. Stephanie? Absolutely. James, we know you'll stay on top of that for us. Thank you so much. When we come back, the deadly love triangle, a police officer taken into custody, accused of shooting two women, one of them she had just broken up with. And so many in Latino America often find themselves most comfortable living a hyphenated dual reality and not fitting in the boxes assigned by society. We explore the issue with podcast hosts Joanna Hausman and Jenny Lorenzo. But up next, Steve Bannon refusing to comply with a January 6th subpoena as former President Trump tells Republicans not to vote in the upcoming elections while trying to consolidate his grip on the party for a potential second presidential run in Himself. We'll examine this all coming up next. This is what being live is Freeze all Maggie. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Oh, okay. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us.
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. Me the a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Christopher Steele is an enigma. Is he hero? Is he traitor? Christopher Steele is a guy who picked a fight with two presidents, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, and he's lived to tell the tale. Christopher Steele, even today, is a mystery. That now infamous dossier said that President Putin has compromising information on President Trump. Supposedly a tape made in the Ritz-Carlton in Moscow showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed where President Obama and his wife once slept. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. It was extraordinary to hear the details. You almost had to look away. It quickly became a question in Washington of how much of this was accurate. I said, take out the PP tape. Please take out the PP tape. The golden rule for golden showers. You just don't talk about sex in reports. When the dossier was published, it exploded onto the scene, and at the heart of it was this shadowy Russian expert. It's a kind of quintessential spy. A veteran of MI6. He wants your secrets, and he charms it out of you. Most of the world first heard your name about five years ago, but you stayed silent. Why speak out now? When you bring the information to the FBI in 2016, were you acting as a patriot or a paid private intelligence officer? Do you think there's a chance that the Russians played you, fed you disinformation? At one point, you're on Vladimir Putin's hit list. Mm -hmm. It was a story of epic proportion. Taking time bomb. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. Explosive. Extraordinary. It changed history. I mean, this is the stuff of movies. I think a lot of this is the stuff of movies. I think for better or worse, Christopher Steele's going to be remembered as the spy who stepped out of the shadows. We're already on the edge of our seats. That was a preview of Out of the Shadows, the first documentary from George Stephanopoulos Productions, streaming on Hulu on Monday. George sitting down exclusively with former MI6 spy Christopher Steele, the man behind the Steele dossier, which helped spark the Russia investigation. And now we're going to turn to the House Committee on the January 6th attack, moving to hold Steve Bannon in criminal content for refusing to cooperate with their investigation. The former Trump White House senior senior advisor is citing the former president's claim of executive privilege. It's just one of many recent signs that former President Trump is insisting on loyalty to him as he continues to push his baseless claims of election fraud. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. 
The House committee investigating the January 6th riot today said it will try to put Steve Bannon behind bars if he refuses to testify, declaring they, quote, will not tolerate defiance of our subpoenas, asking the Justice Department to charge Bannon with criminal contempt of Congress. Bannon's lawyer says he will not be producing documents or testifying because former President Donald Trump, citing executive privilege, has directed him not to. Trump's attempt to stymie the investigation comes as he demands that Republicans make his baseless claims about 2020 election fraud their central issue, saying it's, quote, the single most important thing for Republicans to do. He issued a statement warning if the bogus claims are not solved, Republicans will not be voting in 22 or 24. Hello, Patriots! Trump called into a rally for Republicans in Virginia last night that began with a pledge of allegiance to a flag carried by Trump supporters on the day of the Capitol riot. She's carrying an American flag that was carried at the peaceful rally with Donald J. Trump on January 6th. The Republican candidate for governor of Virginia was forced to address the bizarre display even though he did not actually attend the event. You know, the whole idea of the, the flag thing seems, seems kind of weird to me and is wrong, um, but I don't know enough about it yet, but it does seem weird and wrong. Jonathan Carl joins us now from Washington. John, big picture, do Republicans seem to still be fully embracing former President Trump? Well, they sure seem to be almost up and down the line, Stephanie. In fact, uh, the uh, National Republican Congressional Committee, this is the arm that is helping Republicans in the midterm elections, uh, financing many of those uh, uh, campaigns, uh, actually put out a text message uh, aimed at its uh, supporters who had not yet donated campaign contributions, uh, addressing them as traitors and uh, saying that, uh, that, that they, if they didn't donate, they were deserving deserting President Trump, so clearly making uh, the connection that the big midterm elections uh, for control of the House next year, at least from the Republican leaders that are running those campaigns, uh, is very much uh, a, a test of loyalty to Donald Trump. Republicans sticking by him. Meanwhile, Trump has continued to cultivate his supporters on the road with multiple rallies in recent weeks. Are all signs pointing to a likely 2024 run? Most Republicans who I've spoken to are close to Trump fully expect that he is going to run for re-election. Uh, but, Stephanie, I, I would have to caution that nobody really knows. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, I am sure, is going to be acting like he is going to be running right up to the end. Uh, whether or not he actually pulls the trigger and runs again, uh, nobody really knows. But he also knows that if he doesn't at least keep people thinking that he is running again, uh, he'll have a harder time staying relevant. So I, I wouldn't believe it until you actually see him come out uh, and declare he's running for president. And we're still a few years away, but I'm sure we'll be talking about it until then. And going back to the January 6th commission, has the Justice Department responded on whether they will pursue any criminal action to enforce those subpoenas? Uh, not yet. That's the big question, because Congress uh, can hold uh, somebody in contempt. Congress can issue subpoenas. But as you know, Stephanie, Congress doesn't have its own prosecutors. Uh, Congress doesn't have its own prisons. Uh, it has no ability to actually enforce it on its own. So although this would be a contempt of Congress uh, a citation, it would have to be enforced by the executive branch, not the legislative branch. And we just, we just don't know uh, yet whether or not the Justice Department would go forward and prosecute those charges. So much still unknown. We will continue to watch this. I know you'll stay on top of it for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Still ahead here on Prime, the prominent South Carolina attorney arrested after leaving rehab. What police accuse him of doing to collect life insurance money. Sentencing day for Robert Durst, the real estate heir convicted for killing his best friend more than 20 years ago. And it may be unseasonably warm in large swaths of the country, but winter is coming. And what does that mean for home heating and electric bills? We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, tweeted by Ben Crump, a well-known civil rights attorney who also represented the George Floyd family. Ben Crump tweeting, George Floyd should have turned 48 today.
extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. If you don't want to shave your legs, don't. I was just saying. Oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back, let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Winter is coming, and that means heating bills. Inflation is on the rise across our economy. And tonight, we look at the soaring cost of warming our homes by the numbers. Households should expect to pay as much as 54% more for heat this winter compared to last winter, officials say. Nearly 50% of American homes use natural gas for heat, and those households could pay an average of $746 for it this year. That's a 30% jump from last year. In the Midwest, bills for natural gas could rise 49%, making it the most expensive winter in over a decade. 41% of U.S. homes use electricity for heat, and that cost is expected to rise a more modest 6% to about $1,200. 4% of homes use heating oil, expected to cost 43% more this winter, or about $1,700. And 5% of American homes use propane, which is likely to see the biggest spike in cost. And of course, we're seeing price hikes everywhere. Overall, consumer prices have risen 5.4% from this time last year. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. She died on the steps of a city park, stunning a community. And tonight, the teen convicted for Tessa Major's death finds out how long he will serve behind bars. And Megan the Stallion's new job. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The most powerful stories of our time Anytime. Nightline. 
Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Five, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. More Americans may soon be getting another jab of a COVID-19 vaccine. An FDA panel voting in favor of a third shot for the Moderna vaccine. So we do have a unanimous 19 out of 19 yes vote. The booster, half the dose for most Americans and given six months after the second shot. Friday, the panel will discuss Johnson & Johnson. Already. More than one out of three eligible seniors have gotten their third shot, the booster. Meantime, mixing different vaccines has been a topic of discussion amongst health experts. And now new data from the National Institutes of Health says in early studies it appears to be safe and may be effective, but that more research is needed. A teenager convicted in the stabbing death of Barnard student Tessa Majors learned his fate. Today, a judge sentenced 16-year-old Luciano Lewis to nine years to life in prison. Lewis is one of three teens charged in Majors' murder. He pleaded guilty last month to robbery and murder. Majors was an 18-year-old freshman when she was stabbed to death in a robbery gone wrong in Morningside Park in December of 2019. This gut-wrenching security camera video capturing Majors' final moments playing out in court today. Here, the 18-year-old seen staggering up the stairs of Morningside Park before collapsing in front of a guard station. She died minutes later. An update in the South Carolina case of once prominent attorney. His attorney tells reporters police are calling Alex Murdo a person of interest in the deaths of several victims. But that's not why Murdo was arrested upon his release from drug rehab today. It was instead on fraud charges. He's charged with stealing insurance payments from the sons of his dead housekeeper. Prosecutors say today's arrest is the start of a long process for justice. Murdo's wife and son were murdered. Murdo allegedly confessed to police that hiring a gunman in a failed attempt to kill him so his, his surviving son could collect a life insurance policy. The man police say Alex Murdoch hired to help stage his own death is speaking out about what he says happened on the side of that South Carolina road last month. Curtis Edward Smith, a distant cousin of Murdoch, tells the New York Times he arrived on the road to find Murdoch holding a gun. Murdoch asked Smith to please shoot him in the head. Smith says he refused, but then suddenly, Mr. Murdoch moved as if he was going to shoot himself in the head. Mr. Smith grabbed his arm and twisted it behind his back. The gun went off. Smith says he asked Murdoch if he was okay and then drove away. Real estate heir Robert Durst sentenced to life in prison without parole in Los Angeles. Durst convicted of killing best friend Susan Berman more than 20 years ago. Prosecutors say he shot Berman to keep her from talking to police about the reopened investigation into the 1982 disappearance of his wife. The body of Kathy Durst has never been found. If you had killed either Kathy or Susan, you would never tell us, correct? Correct. Nothing further. 
Butterball is recalling thousands of pounds of turkey because of what could be in the meat. Over 14,000 pounds of Butterball ground turkey is being recalled because it may have blue plastic in it. The USDA is announcing the ground turkey items were produced on September 28th and include certain two and a half pound trays of Butterball all natural ground turkey and three pound trays of Kroger ground turkey. The problem was discovered when customers complained about blue plastic in the meat. Nobody has reported being injured by eating the plastic. <laughs> Someone stole your hottie sauce. Now my hottie sauce. Something's cooking in the Stallion Saloon, a collab between Megan the Stallion and Popeyes. The hot girl summer rapper teasing her hottie sauce, which combines honey, cider vinegar, and Aleppo pepper. She's also designing matching merchandise, including a bikini with flames and a saucy shirt. The Texas-Louisiana collab comes October 19th. Welcome back. A New York City police officer is in custody after allegedly shooting two women and killing one. The officer, who was at one point dating one of the women, was off duty at the time. She's accused of shooting them when they returned to the home where the officer's ex-girlfriend lived. The ex-girlfriend survived, but the other woman did not. And the tributes continue for former baseball player and longtime broadcaster Ray Fossey. His wife says he died after a long battle with cancer. He's remembered for this moment right here with Pete Rose during the 1970 All-Star Game, fracturing and separating his shoulder. He later spent 36 years as an Oakland A's broadcaster. That organization tonight saying they are heartbroken. Ray Fossey was 74. Now to the lack of representation. It is something we hear about time and time and again, whether it's in movies or corporate America, but the topic is so much more complex than that, particularly in the Latino community. Whether you're Mexican-American, Honduran-American, or Dominican-American and beyond, it's often referred to as living in the hyphen. If you're not familiar with that phrase, we're going to break it down for you right now. Joining me are two hilarious comedians who have taken this topic and tackled it head on, the hosts of the hyphenated podcast. There they are right there, Joanna Hausman and Jenny Lorenzo. Thank you so much for being here with us. So your podcast, with its nearly 40 episodes, it's very wide-ranging, you cover a lot. Uh, you're both comedians, but on hyphenated, you really go there with topics from the use of the word Latinx to the political crisis in Cuba. What made you decide that you weren't just going to be funny. You weren't just going to be entertaining, but also thought-provoking. Jenny, kick it off. <laughs> kick it off for us. Oh, my gosh. I think it's something that honestly happened organically because Joanna and I have really only seen each other in person for a whole of 45 minutes. That is fact. Um, but we've been good friends and made each other crack up all these years. And so we thought, yeah, let's do this. It's going to be so relatable. And, you know, it's going to be about living in the hyphen and, and all this. But as the conversations went on, we really wanted to touch upon these more serious topics because they're important to us. And it's a way for our audience to see a different side of who we are other than our comedy. Absolutely. And Joanna, what, what about you? What made you kind of break this down in this way? So I've been creating comedy online specifically about the duality of my identity since like 2012 and through comedy, through five minute videos, you know, talking about the difference between Argentinians and Venezuelans, how um, Dominicans speak Spanish differently than Mexicans. And although that was very fulfilling, there was something that was sort of lacking, which was the more, the more nuanced conversations about stuff that isn't really easy to answer. You know, how do we feel about the term Latinx? How do we feel about the inherent sexism sometimes in our communities? How do we feel about the fact that politicians usually put us into a monolith? These are conversations that are very difficult to sort of break down in very easy and, you know, funny five-minute videos. These are conversations that merit you know, longer, more drawn out conversations. And that's what we've tried to do in this podcast.
and conversations that are educating so many people. So I want to discuss your identity policing on social media episode. Joanna, you started off the episode discussing a Twitter back and forth that you got into with someone over your identity as a Jewish Venezuelan American. Tell us a little bit about the range of critiques that you get from the constructive to the unfortunate anti-Semitic. How do you deal with that? <laughs> oh my goodness. I remember that the first video I ever published online where I sort of broke down the misconception misconceptions of being Latino, I remember reading the comments and saying, oh my goodness, should I go back online? <laughs> this is really tough to read. And then I realized that a lot of the people that didn't see me as Latina we're also not seeing a lot of my friends who were Latino as Latino, whether they be Afro-Latino, Asian Latino, like me, a Jewish Latina. Um, the idea of what a Latino or Latina is, is something that is very um, misinterpreted and misrepresented. So when I get comments online that sort of tell me I am not Latina, that I take as sort of a responsibility to prove them wrong and show them that I am, and not, not only me, but so many other people that they assume are not. Um, and there's a lot of identity policing within this community. And I think it comes from the fact that, you know, the word Latino encapsulates over 20 countries with different idioms, with different cultures, with different idiosyncrasies. People are trying to fight their way up to be the Latino. There isn't one Latino. It's impossible. That word is just sort of, sort of amorphous in its in its inception and and its and its in, in its use. So for me, every time I get a criticism, it is just fuel for me to not only speak about my experience, but bring forth people not only to the podcast but on other things that I'm creating that don't represent that stereotype to break that stereotype. Right, and you nailed it. The Latino community is a melting pot within a melting pot, basically. Jenny, you also discussed the backlash you received from posting your Ancestry.com DNA results and how you had to pull down your video. Being a proud Cuban-American from Miami, describe that whiplash that you felt when, when you're told by anyone, let alone, let alone another Latino, that you're not Latina enough. You know, it is a fear that I had from the moment I decided that I was going to do this for a living and specifically as a comedian represent my culture in this way because I could have gone in a different route and that was something that I dealt with back when I was an actor in Miami. I was told that I should change my last name and, you know, I should tell my agents that I don't speak <laughs> uh, Spanish and I did. I did that for a while because that was unfortunately the norm and what was required of a lot of Latino actors. Um, and thankfully things are changing, but when it came to the backlash, um, specifically with that video, uh, I shouldn't say I was surprised because I wasn't, I really wasn't surprised. I've been making internet content for so long and I've been trolled for anything ranging from the way I sound to again, my heritage and not being uh, Cuban enough. Uh, but I think when it really hit me was when I was working at BuzzFeed. It was my first job out here in Los Angeles, and I was one of the co-founders of Better Like. And I was terrified because I'm used to character acting. People are used to seeing me as different characters with different wigs. No one really knew who I was as Jenny Lorenzo on this brand new gigantic platform that reached reaches till this day millions and millions of people right and so i remember i was one of the only cuban americans specifically um at the company and so of course i'm making content that's very caribbean that's very cuban centric and some of the comments at the time were like why is this girl our cuban representation that's not how my family is or that's not what i look like and you know and I was like much younger back then and I was obviously hurt. And I'm not saying it doesn't still sting, but I think I've learned to really understand and empathize with these sorts of complaints. And it comes down to the fact that there's so little representation in media that when you're the one Guatemalan that's either a content creator or an actor, all the Guatemalans are gonna look at that one Guatemalan and go, oh my gosh, they better fit the exact experience that I've lived. If not, they're not a real Guatemalan. And so there's a lot of pressure to be that like one 
Cuban at BuzzFeed, you know? <laughs> exactly. Being like, this is how my family does it, but your family might not, and that's okay. Right. Well, progress is slow, lady. We, ladies, we have seen it, but we have to stick with it. Para adelante. Thank you so much. And Jenny, we look forward to your work with Disney Plus, of course, ABC's parent company. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, take a look at this beautiful photo taken in Turkey. Uh, apparently, it was taken in Cappadocia, which is known for its beautiful balloons, where you can take pictures like this and post them on Instagram, perhaps. <laughs> pictures on swings that hang from cranes. A very lovely sight. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things, including some clarity for those vaccinated by Moderna and wondering about when booster shots may become available. We'll have more on the FDA panel's recommendation. And we know about the supply shortages threatening holiday shopping, but there are workarounds if you're concerned. Stay with us. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. They were very devoted to each other. They were what you would want your marriage to be. Joe Bryan guilty of the shooting death of his wife. That was a complete shock. When you hear that guilty verdict. You just can't believe something like that can happen to you. 2020 Friday on ABC. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A former Marine who posted videos on social media criticizing top military leaders and their handling of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan pled guilty today during a special court martial. Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller was facing multiple charges, including failure to obey an order. Scheller's first video was posted the same day. 13 U.S. service members were killed in an attack outside Kabul's airport. He continued to speak out until he was placed in pretrial confinement by the military. Prince William is telling billionaires funding the space tourism race to instead focus on solving dire environmental problems here on planet Earth. The British royal made the comments a day after former Star Trek actor William Shatner became the oldest man to fly to space in a rocket funded by Amazon founder Jeff Bezos. And you may remember that infamous Banksy art piece that self-shredded seconds after it was sold three years ago. Well, the semi-intact painting fetched an eye-popping $25 million at an auction today, close to 20 times its pre-shredded price. The sale is a record for Banksy, beating out a piece sold for around $22 million in March. Now to the coronavirus pandemic and possibly more booster shots on the way. An FDA advisory committee meeting today to discuss Moderna's third dose and decide whether it's safe and effective. The same process expected to begin for Johnson & Johnson on Friday. ABC's Whit Johnson has the latest. Tonight, booster shots for millions of Americans who got the Moderna vaccine, now a major step closer to authorization. We do have a unanimous 19 out of 19 yes votes, and that concludes the voting portion. A key FDA panel voting unanimously to recommend that third shot six months after the second dose for anyone 65 and older, 18 and older at high risk from an underlying health condition, or 18 and older whose job may put them at greater risk for exposure to the virus. If the full FDA and CDC sign off next week, Moderna booster shots would roll out to the same groups now eligible for the Pfizer boosters. Given that Pfizer blazed a trail with its booster, it made sense that Moderna would follow suit. There were no safety signals involved. And what we're trying to do is bring your immunity up to the point when you were first vaccinated. And essentially, these boosters will do that trick. The Moderna booster would be only a half dose after data indicated that was enough to restore protection. Overall, the Moderna vaccine has remained highly effective against severe illness and hospitalization, showing less waning over time than its counterparts Pfizer and J&J.
Still, Moderna says its booster shot, given at least six months after the second dose, increased protective antibodies by 15-fold one month later. Moderna also finding side effects from its booster were similar to those after first and second doses. But today, some panel members arguing the main focus should be on getting the 66 million eligible unvaccinated Americans their first shot. The people who are in the ICU aren't there because they haven't gotten a third dose. They're there because they haven't gotten any dose. Tomorrow, the panel will review the Johnson & Johnson booster, along with data on the effectiveness of mixing vaccines. An NIH study also finding there could be an extra benefit for people who got the J&J &J vaccine to get a boost from Pfizer or Moderna. I think these early studies are pointing to the potential value of mixing and matching, but it's likely too early, and we're going to really need more data to see sort of full recommendations. And soon, 28 million children between the ages of 5 and 11 could be eligible for their first vaccine shot from Pfizer as early as November 3rd. Today, President Biden promising those doses will be ready to go. If authorized, we are ready. We have purchased enough vaccines for all children between the ages of 5 and 11 in the United States. Thank you very much for that report, Wit. And joining us now for more is Dr. Alok Patel, a physician at Stanford Children's Health. Thank you so much, doctor, for joining us once again. Moderna is opting to go with half a dose for its booster shot. Why do you think that is? You know, Stephanie, I think it's basically, according to what Moderna was saying, was that this half dose from their early data showed less reactions in terms of kind of people feeling sore or just kind of feeling crummy after getting a shot. You know, and this might make a difference in the long run, it may not, but one of the concerns brought up by the committee was that, hey, but all our data is based on the full 100 microgram dose. So is this really going to affect that long-term immune response? It's too early to tell, but it seems like Moderna was just trying to play it safe, given that there's no real long-term data on a booster and how it's going to affect people. But the bottom line is, is two things that people should know, is that the booster is still safe. And if you got the full dose without the booster, you still have incredible protection against hospitalization and or death. And doctor, of course, researchers are waiting for more of that data, but looking forward to tomorrow where mixing and matching booster shots will be discussed. Do you expect the FDA to eventually green light mixing and matching? I do. I do. I really do. So mixing and matching or heterologous vaccination or heterologous priming, do you want that million dollar scientific term, is not a new concept. It's been around for a while. And there's studies out of Europe that looked at Pfizer and AstraZeneca and they showed a good response when Pfizer followed the AstraZeneca shot. And this is kind of analogous to what we saw when Johnson & Johnson, kind of an, an adenovirus DNA vaccine, was followed by an mRNA vaccine, Moderna or Pfizer. And I think not only does this give a more robust immune response, but it also will increase the availability for a lot of people out there, including the 15 million who got a Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But it is important to note that the studies showing this only show the antibody response, and there are two arms to the immune system. So... It is going to require a little bit more detailed analysis, and that's what we're all looking forward to with tomorrow's meeting. And so many people have questions. So let's say if someone received the Johnson & Johnson shot and the FDA does green light the booster, would you recommend mixing and matching instead of getting a Johnson & Johnson booster? Stephanie, I'm already getting this question right now. People have been messaging me about this even before the mixing and matching study was coming out, and it's a hard one. You know, I think there's there's two ways to look at this right now. Yes, if you were if you were faced with both the Moderna Pfizer vaccine, I should say all three, and the Johnson and Johnson, you needed your booster. According to what we know right now in terms of the data and the early analysis, I would go with a different vaccine if you got the Johnson and Johnson one to kind of give you that heterologous primed boost. But then someone else might say to me, hey, I just want to get two Johnson & Johnson shots because I got it the first time. That's okay. It's great. That's going to be totally fine. We're not saying that you're going to be severely impaired. Remember, all these studies are just based on antibody level, and there's a whole other thing to think about. That's the memory component of the immune system also. And I think this is going to be an important asterisk for the committee to address because there's a lot of people out there with varying levels of exposure and underlying risk. Okay, so since mRNA vaccines have been proven to be so effective and the technology now allows scientists to produce new ones incredibly fast, do you see a future where mRNA vaccines become a new normal? And we're getting mRNA shots, for instance, to prevent other illnesses. 100%. I think mRNA technology is here to stay. It's going to take a lot of education towards the public because people are acting like mRNA technology came flying out the gate and all of a sudden we developed a vaccine in one year. And in reality, mRNA technology has been around for decades. 
And scientists have been using this to study vaccines potentially for Zika, Ebola, tuberculosis, HIV, even gene therapy, looking at cancer treatment, autoimmune disease treatment. I mean, this, the, it, the list goes on. And the technology is brilliant, it's cost effective. You can scale it up a lot faster. It uses materials that are already accessible. And the mRNA technology is almost like plug and play. So we could even get a more effective flu vaccine from this. And so I think that the, the future is very bright when it comes to mRNA technology. We just need to make sure that we're doing the right education towards the public. And we continue that worldwide collaboration which just produced incredible results when it came to this mRNA vaccine against COVID. Dr. Patel, you have covered so much for us tonight. We really appreciate it. We will be calling you back, okay? Thank you. I'll be here. mRNA for the win. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, the firefight continues in Southern California as crews battle fierce flames to try to get the upper hand on the Alisal fire burning north of Los Angeles. So far, more than 16,800 acres have burned and it's 5% contained. That's it. Evacuations were already ordered and officials are hoping a break in the weather will help their efforts. ABC's Alex Stone has the latest. For firefighters, it's a race against the wind, trying to use a break to tackle flames before Santa Ana winds return on Friday and into the weekend. Efforts are focused on the Alisal fire, burning in a remote area of Santa Barbara County. At times, a 101 freeway shut down. Now firefighters are getting a chance to make some progress, but that window is closing. We expect over the next few days to have some seesawing action. We expect that uh, for weeks you will see, uh, if not months, you'll see uh, fire crews out there putting out hot spots. On Monday and Tuesday, the flames on the Alisal fire exploded. Wind gusts were up to 70 miles per hour. Embers jumping a mile ahead of the flaming front, creating spot fires, flames pushing toward the ocean. Because of that wind, the biggest asset firefighters have, air attack, could not fly. Normally with a fire like this, you're, you're used to seeing uh, dozens of air tankers and helicopters flying around uh, making the attack. Uh, They're all poised and ready to do so every time the wind lets up. But on Friday, the concern will not just be Santa Barbara County, it'll be throughout Southern California. Firefighters are already exhausted. I uh, had the opportunity to see some really, really tired uh, folks out there on the line. With the strong Santa Ana winds blowing, humidity levels around 8% and 90 degree temperatures, a red flag warning indicates extreme life-threatening fire behavior will be likely. The winds return as Patrick Brown watches firefighters trying to save his family's ranch. Put my, my lifetime in it and just hope it makes it. One silver lining by Sunday, winds are expected to come in from the ocean and bring some clouds and even drizzle. So many people there losing so much. Our thanks to Alex for that report. Next to the teen convicted of killing Barnard College student Tessa Majors. That teen was sentenced today. The prosecutor reading the family's heartbreaking statement as her father sobbed. ABC's Ariel Reshef brings us that report. She was the Barnard College freshman whose murder in a New York City park sent shockwaves throughout the country. Tonight, one of the teens involved in the 2019 fatal stabbing of Tessa Majors receiving a maximum sentence. Luciano Lewis pleading guilty to second degree murder and first degree robbery sentenced to nine years to life. This gut-wrenching security camera video capturing Majors' final moments playing out in court today. Here, the 18-year-old seen staggering up the stairs of Morningside Park before collapsing in front of a guard station. She died minutes later. Lewis, now 16, was just 14 at the time. Prosecutors say he and two other teens robbed and ruthlessly attacked majors just steps from campus. Today, the judge saying the defendant was and is extremely young. He has his whole life ahead of him, but Tessa Majors does not. Major's father, overcome with emotion, sobbing audibly as prosecutors read a family statement. The hopes and dreams we had for our daughter Tess came to an end. Her family misses her every day. Our heart aches. Our grief is profound. A second teen involved pleaded guilty in family court and is now serving out his sentence. A third teen who was accused of wielding the knife that killed Tessa Majors is awaiting trial. Stephanie.
Thank you so much, Ariel. Now to American workers and the major strike underway. 10,000 John Deere workers on the picket line arguing that while company profits and CEO pay have soared, their wages have not kept up. Thousands of workers also striking Kellogg, Kaiser Hospitals, and now Hollywood is bracing for a potential walkout as well. Here's ABC's senior national correspondent, Terry Moran, in Illinois tonight. <laughs> Tonight, more than 10,000 workers at John Deere are on the picket lines in Iowa, Illinois, and Kansas. On strike for the first time in 35 years at Deere. They're demanding better pay, secure pensions, what they call a fair share of a hugely profitable American company. What's at stake here? Why are you guys out here? The raise that was offered to us wasn't what we were expecting. Um, and the company wants to eliminate pensions for the people that hire after us. Workers argue that what John Deere is offering them now is nowhere near enough, as John Deere's profits grew by 61% in recent years, and their CEO's salary grew by 160% during the pandemic. We work and work, and it's time. It's time to get what we deserve. After weeks of negotiations, the workers at John Deere voted overwhelmingly to reject a contract that their own union, the United Auto Workers, had negotiated with management. There was a pretty blatant attack on our benefits. The union is standing behind its decision to turn down the deal, which offered a 5% raise in the first year, not what the workers expected, at a company that estimates it will make $5.9 billion in profits in 2021. Nationwide, more and more workers are flexing their collective muscles. Last week, 1,400 Kellogg cereal workers launched strikes in Tennessee, Nebraska, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. In California and Oregon, 24,000 nurses and other health care workers at Kaiser Permanente voted to authorize a strike over pay and better working conditions. And soon, Hollywood may see a walkout. Roughly 60,000 film and TV workers are set to go on strike on Monday. Tonight, the women and men here on the picket line, the people who build those iconic green John Deere farm vehicles, they're bracing for a long strike. Our thanks to Terry. We turn now to the supply chain crunch and the log jam at the nation's ports. Some are now working around the clock to get goods off of ships, but a shortage of workers to deliver them is keeping the bottleneck in place, contributing to rising prices for nearly everything Americans are buying. ABC's Kaylee Hartung reports tonight from the port of Los Angeles. Tonight, with the holidays approaching fast, the all-out push to get goods off those backlog ships and onto shelves, with the Port of Los Angeles now running operations around the clock. Officials know the clock is ticking. We're only four and a half weeks away from Black Friday. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. What is sitting in all these containers behind us? Everything. <laughs> yeah, everything, everything you can imagine. Toilet paper, uh, your shirts, um, your shoes. Peloton uh, bike. Your bikes, <laughs> right? Computers. Air computers. Everything air everybody's air. waiting for. Longshoremen telling me some of these containers have been sitting here for six months with a shortage of truck drivers to get the goods on the highway and into stores. It's not just making things harder to find, it's making them more expensive. This year has already seen record-breaking price jumps for products like children's shoes, up nearly 12%, and furniture, up more than 11%. Quite simply, where is the breakdown? The breakdown is in the supply chain in general. The supply chain disrupted by the pandemic. The cost of shipping containers to move goods from Asia to the U.S. soaring, plus a labor shortage and outdated infrastructure, all contributing to this log jam. We followed the supply chain from the port to the warehouse. And as for those hopes of those goods getting there in time for the holidays, what is that cutoff? It was probably uh, realistically about a month ago. As Kaylee reported, that supply change nightmare could disrupt holiday shopping, but there are still ways to find this year's top gifts. ABC's Becky Worley has tips for shopping the resale markets. The Cliff family was desperate for a gaming console for nine-year-old son Ethan last year. But with the PlayStation 5 in short supply, the gift never happened. It was pretty much impossible to find. Dad Greg, he thought maybe this year, but... The new Xbox, the new PlayStation, they've been hard to find all year because of the chip shortage, and they're going to be nearly impossible to find um, this holiday season. And it's not just tech. Some sneakers, collectible toys, and trendy clothing items are hard to find, too. The pressure is real um, for everyone involved in the retail process this year. So that has gift givers turning to online sites like eBay or Facebook Marketplace to find the coveted devices. 
But for many, that can lead to worries about counterfeits and scams. And that's given rise to resale markets, where goods are verified as being both in stock and legit. Hard to come by luxury fashion goods or something that consumers really want, might not be able to get it, but that they also want to know are verified. These sites have started branching off into other items because they have this infrastructure in place. Sites like Stadium Goods, Goat, and StockX employ actual humans to verify items. And now they've expanded to a wide range of items. StockX releasing a list of the most coveted items they expect to sell this fall and winter. A Hot Wheels Tesla truck, this duffel bag, these Diplo Crocs, Psychedelic Crocs, really? There's the Nintendo Switch OLED, and yep, the PS5. Which dad Greg was able to snag for his son for this Christmas? Shh, don't tell. So he's gonna be super surprised that we have it. And I'm really, really excited to see his face when he unwraps that and he sees that PS5 box. Start shopping now. Our thanks to Becky. And still to come, the investigation into a horrific fire in Taiwan and our journey with one very dedicated truck driver. It's coming up. This is what being live is Green all Jackie, about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people. No squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. Me the a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. Major clashes in Lebanon's capital city of Beirut, a country mired in economic turmoil and political gridlock. Two militias briefly turned neighborhoods into war zones, leaving at least six people dead. There are fears new violence could be coming as the government teeters toward collapse. At the center of the clashes and protests is how the government is handling an investigation into that massive August 2020 port explosion. Just this week, the government suspended the inquiry into what exactly happened. And a blaze at a residential building in Taiwan killed at least 14 people and injured dozens in the early morning hours. Eyewitness video showed the 13-story building engulfed in smoke and flames with fire trucks and emergency vehicles parked along the surrounding streets. More than 50 people have been hospitalized, some of them in critical condition.
The world's tallest woman was officially recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records. The Turkish woman stands at a casual seven feet and seven inches. She is just 24 years old and she suffers from a rare genetic disease known as Weaver syndrome that causes rapid growth among other conditions. The young woman says she wants people to know that being different is not as bad as you think. Well said. We have been talking so much in recent weeks about the shortages increasing on store shelves. And it's a reminder that if it weren't for dedicated truckers, most of us would be without just about every essential in life, from food and clothing to toilet paper. And as the nation faces a shortage of truck drivers, our Will Gans hits the road with one very dedicated big rig driver. Whatever you think you know about the life of a truck driver, you can go all the way to California with no music. And no GPS. <laughs> really? Really. <laughs> Get ready to change gears. It's no easy feat getting inside. Like, for reference, my head is lower than the chair. Granted, I'm no Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but... Debbie Desiderato has been trucking across America for 22 years. Sometimes I just enjoy just listening to the engine, and next thing you know, it's been five days, and all I've listened to was the engine. <laughs> Originally from Australia, Debbie is now a wife and mother who calls Long Island, New York, her home. Sometimes. Like the 3.6 million other truck drivers in this country, most days are spent on the road. 260 is my average days driving. A lot of people do more like 340 or something. But no two trips are the same. I might be hauling military freight, trade show freight, dog food one day and cotton balls the next day. In fact, 80% of U.S. communities depend solely on the trucking industry as the only means to deliver their goods. The pandemic hitting hard. When it hit, it put me out of work for about three months straight. Not to mention the rest stops and restaurants closing that truck drivers rely on for food. Which is why Transfix, a transportation solutions provider, decided to thank one lucky driver in a big way. The lives of drivers is so difficult and they deserve so much respect for what they do. So many hours, so many days on the road, uh, time away from families, the basics, right? Like clean bathrooms, uh, healthy food options, so limited. Transfix partnering with celebrity handyman Jason Cameron to renovate Debbie's cab. You know, anything that we could do to really help her in her day to day and really build a home away from home. Debbie's new digs upgraded. A full size fridge, plants, pillows, and a spot for her beloved guitar right underneath the Australian flag. Wow. That is so unique. Nobody's got this. A surprise worthy of a driver who works a truckload. Here's to the truck drivers, the truckers, the truckies, whatever you call them, you guys rock. <laughs> Cannot forget the truckers. Thanks so much to Will Gans for that report. We love a good Will piece. Thank you. And it's the talk of the internet right now. Adele's new single, Easy On Me, has just dropped. Take a listen. Good. Love her. You can hear more of this new song and maybe cry a little bit. Let it out. It's You can watch her show, on, or you can watch the video, rather, after this show on YouTube, where the official video racked up more than half a million views in just 30 minutes after it was posted. It sounds great. And that is it for our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks so much for streaming with us.